howdy do buckaroos this is joe layden with cowboys and indians magazine and i'm happy to say that one of my favorite sitcoms rutherford falls is coming back this week for season two on peacock and i'm even happier to say that i recently had a chance to sit down and talk with the show's co-creator and showrunner sierra teller ornelas and the show's star and co-writer jana schmidi and they spilled some beans about what we can expect in terms of Terry putting on his dancing shoes and Bobby maybe running for mayor. Sarah, at what point did you decide, okay, uh, we're gonna have to make up an Indian tribe? I mean, we, 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 um... we can't go by, go with an, an existing tribal. We may upset somebody. Oh, no, that I think for me, it was really the white history was fake, you know? So if the Rutherford family wasn't real, Ed's, uh, the character Nathan that Ed plays isn't real, the town of Rutherford Falls isn't real. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of like fake native history already created. I feel like we've done enough of that. And so mm -hmm. I worked for the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC for many years. And I remember there was a year where all of these teen girls kept coming in asking for the wolf exhibits and asking all the native workers there, could you turn into a wolf? And we had like no idea what they were talking about until someone was like, it's this movie Twilight that shows the Quileute nation, which is a real tribe. And, and the, the writer of that just put them in because she felt like doing it. And overnight kind of really changed a lot of the folks um, from that reservation's life. They had tour buses show up, people coming in, taking photos, asking people to turn into wolves. And it just was like a reminder early in my career of how like pop culture can really affect uh, affect our day, <laughs> you know? And so the last thing I wanted was to, to do that to another native nation and assign more false history to them. So, and also the, the show is a pan-native show. So it's a reflection of the native writers that are in the room. So we pay a lot of homage and very respectful to the Northeast, the region that it's set, but a lot of the storylines, a lot of the, you know, personal stories come from the writer's room and we're all from all different nations from throughout Turtle Island. You know, this reminds me a little bit of years ago, uh, I was speaking with Spike Lee, uh, and I think it was right after uh, Do the Right Thing. And uh, I said, Spike, because I, always called him Spike. Uh, of course, your best friend. <laughs> you know, hey, we're, we're like this, you know. Anyway, uh, I said, you know, Spike, it, it's really fascinating to me that uh, you create more vividly drawn, you know, white characters as a black filmmaker than most white filmmakers uh, are able to create, uh, you know, black characters. And he looked patiently at me, you know, as Spike often does. And, and, and said, we, you know, Joe, uh, we have a lot more experience seeing white characters. Yeah. Um, and I thought, Indeed. oh, yeah. Uh, look, let me pick up the tab here. Uh, you know, <laughs> and that fascinates me about this show is that uh, everyone has his or her reasons. If that makes yeah. Sense. For sure, it makes sense. Yeah, I think everyone has a blind spot in the show. And I think on any given Sunday, the characters are someone's ally or adversary. We wanted to, you know, express a world in which you kind of had to hold two things in your hands at the same time. So, you know, Regan and Nathan are best friends. They genuinely love each other. They're two dorks against the world, but they also have a lot of, you know, systemic differences and, and, and there's a lot of tension between that friendship and, and just their backgrounds that that creates. You know, Terry is a very ambitious um, businessman who's also a goofy dad who's trying to figure out how to make sure his daughter thinks he's cool. So we wanted to kind of find a way to give each character, not just the characters of color, but also the white characters, some depth and some 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 layers. And it was very important for us to do that. And I, I agree with you, a lot of it draws from the fact that I think Indigenous people were, were the first here, you know? So if anyone has had a chance to observe everyone and different experiences, it's us. And we really led with that kind of kind of um, guiding light, not just to tell our own stories, but to really get to share our perceptions of, of other types of people. Okay, I'm gonna be embarrassed if I've missed this. <laughs> okay. I actually have seen all of the episodes that have been on. I've seen okay. you know, the first episode that was at ATX. Has anyone ever asked Terry if he's any relation to the British comic? 
Yes, I was I was um, interviewed by Elvis Mitchell. Uh, so you're a very good company uh, for the treatment. And he mentioned that Terry Thomas, uh, the British comedian, which I think is so funny. Um, that was not intentional, but I love that as a weird kind of uh, accidental Easter egg, if you will. But, but I mean, in the show, no one has ever- No one has asked, that. no, not on the show, no, only in life. Okay, okay, not, not on the that, show. That, that's fine. Then I, I thought, you know. <laughs> Maybe well, season three. They made that big joke in the first episode. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just- No, you're great. You know, it's, it's, We're doing it. Um. Are there days when you're still surprised you're able to get away with this? You know, I mean, I just love making comedy and I love working with friends and and people who I've trusted for many years and new voices that I've never met and want to champion. So, I mean, I just feel incredibly lucky. It's like any day you're working in a comedy room and you're getting like free cookies and getting to laugh with your friends, you know, um, I was on Brooklyn Nine Nine when my I was pregnant with my my first child, only child, and uh, I remember he would move around a lot when um, around after lunch because there was a lot of laughter. He was just like bathed in laughter, and we're thinking like this is the coolest way to grow a baby. It's just like bathe in laughter. So I I mean the tone of our show I think is very specific, but I just I love making comedy and I love getting to now make comedy from my own genuine perspective and experiences. There's nothing like it. You know, it, it seems to me from the bleachers, uh, there's always been, you know, periodic attempts to deal with indigenous people as three dimensional characters. And there have been a <laughs> deal with. Folks, you know, well, yeah. uh, there have been a noble efforts. Ah, I got you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did, notice I didn't say noble savage. Uh, and, did it? Uh, but it seems to me that it was almost like, two or three years ago, somebody flipped a switch and there's a lot of indigenous representation out there. I mean, not as yeah, much I mean, as there should be, but- I was gonna I say there's four. It's, it's like a 400% increase, but there's yeah, still yeah, only four. Yeah. Like, you know, it's a, we're, we're, if you're grading on a curve, we're doing very, very well. Um, if you're grading on a hundred years of cinema and television, well, you still have no, a very long way to go. But, uh, but no, it's an exciting time. It's a really exciting time. I think that, you know, I think Taika winning an Oscar and, and, and really pulling up a lot of folks that he had come up with, like Sterling and, and Dennis and all these people. And I think that, you know, I've been working in television for 12 years and had been kind of working my way up from the bottom and had worked with Mike Schur and Ed Helms and kind of had earned a lot of emotional currency in the industry. And so when the time came that they wanted to tell a story that um, at the time I had been kind of taking a break and trying to figure out, I was like, I know the next project I want to do is going to have native content in it. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, and just they were ready and I was ready. Um, so I think, you know, this is like the culmination of decades of hard work from other people who did not get opportunities were really standing a lot of people's shoulders. Um, people like Bird Running Water, who really created um, the Sundance Native program. He was in charge of it, it started before him, but really created this sort of community of, of um, allyship and people helping each other. I think a lot of programs before that were like kind of hunger games based. There can only be one, you know, person um, and they have to die for the next person to come in. And I think, you know, we really came up um, as people who really wanted to help each other and champion each other. I think if you see what Sydney Freeland's doing, what Sterling has done is incredible. Um, we're all just really trying to, to really hit it out of the park. And, and I think that's why you're seeing all this momentum. In some ways, uh... Rutherford Falls is like a sitcom that on some level is aware it's a sitcom. And in some ways, I think, is kind of subversive in the way that it uses sitcom tropes to maybe not make fun of other shows, but kind <laughs> of, you know, you're used to this kind of thing happening. Well. That isn't going to happen here. Yeah, I think I think all of our moves comedically and storytelling wise are very deliberate, but I don't think it feels written. So I think like we, you know, we the people making these the show are people who love television. I think a lot of times people are trying to make something that's like different than television or like these little movies and things like that, which I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. And like, I love watching that stuff. 
but I grew up on like eighties television, you know, a different world and, Mm -hmm. and living single and friends and, and cheers. And, and so I always, it's, it's the, it's still the most, you know, comforting, cathartic kind of medium is, is television. And it's, it's intimate. It's in our homes, it's in our phones, you know, and I think whether we are aware of it or not, we are shaped by classic television. And so the opportunity to have native people occupy that space and kind of like decolonize that space, I take really a lot of pride in. So while sometimes it might seem like, you know, a two person scene with like quick jokes and ha ha ha's, and it is, getting to see two native actors just nail mm-hmm. those rhythms that I grew up loving and, and really, you know, Jana is such an incredible comedic actor. Michael, who has never done comedy before, knocks it out of the park. And, and so to watch them, you know, adhere to these kind of rhythms, um, I love it. I just love it. And sometimes it is subversive and sometimes you can't help but be aware of native representation and you got to kind of talk about that and, and, and like poke fun at that, but we also can poke fun at ourselves and make fun of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, like that is the beauty of, I think, sitcoms. And, and so, yeah, like, I think we're like, we are unapologetically television and that's what I love about our show. I'm sorry. I had to laugh. I was thinking about it. I I don't want to spoil the gag, but in the first episode of the second season, uh, the reference to the DVD of oh yes episode. that was <laughs> there was some debate in our room about like those objects and one of them was that and we we're like come on man they really think about what you're saying here anyone who was fighting that note I can't wait for people to see it but no and I think that to me like is exactly what you're talking about is like our specific kind of awareness of whiteness that's not what most people see that our perceptions of how the world works is original and different and funny um, and I think that joke is like a perfect example. But, but also, it, it's one of the few shows where you would, you acknowledge a reality that's out there. I mean, it, 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 it's not nearly the same thing, but I always get annoyed in, in like vampire movies where somebody doesn't say, you know, this is like Dracula. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like Dracula doesn't exist. Right, you know, right, right. It, it's like, no. <laughs> Someone say, oh, this reminds me of Bella Lugosi. It's like, nobody even No, totally. No, hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I think part of being an indigenous person is being hyper aware of how people are perceiving you, how people's misconceptions can completely shape your freaking day, you know? And so I think to not talk about that and to try to be authentically a native show would be kind of impossible. Like, I think we're hyper aware of, of those things. You know, it's like, it would be weird to be a vampire and make a show about vampires and not reference those characters that you're talking about. So yeah, no, I, I think we're, we're very aware of it, but we try to also, you know, we're also a part of society. We're a part of pop culture. Like we grew up on all these movies just like everyone else did. And so it's also just referencing our lives. Now, again, I don't want to spoil the gag, but um, are we going to see any more of Michael dancing? I mean, well, I would love it. I mean, I hope, I hope we do. Michael can do anything. So I feel like we just, we just put a bunch of prompts in a hat and pull one each season and <laughs> see what he can do. Michael in space, Michael uh, tight roping, but he, he really was so lovely. And he and Kimberly uh, Guerrero, who plays his wife, Renee, have a dance number in the season uh, premiere. And it was something you've just never seen native people do before like we never get that and i've always said that you know michael is the patrick swayze of indian country so it was a perfect perfect fit um do you remember the point in the first season maybe the first episode i don't know where the thought vividly formed in your head you know we're gonna get to do this this is working you know, we, we were in yeah. the writer's room, we were casting, and now we're here. This works. We, I, I keep going back to, we're going to get away with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've pulled them. Um, yeah, I mean, I am a very superstitious Navajo, so I was like, this will never be on television. I was like, something's going to go wrong, something's going to happen, and, you know, Mike and Ed are being like, you're crazy, and then COVID happened, and, like, the day of our first production meeting, we had to fire everyone and tell everyone to go home. And it was horrific. I was like, I told you. And they're like, this is a global pandemic. It's not about your show <laughs> like, and your superstition. And um, and then we came back. We got to co- come back and, and we were masked up and wearing these shields. And 
And I was like, well, no, you know, it wouldn't be a native situation if it wasn't the hardest version of it. And, you know, having to do things that are just 10 times harder than everyone. And so we, we attacked it and we did what we do, which is we, we use every part of the situation and make the most of it. And when you see, uh, you know, I remember seeing Jana and Ed on set and they just started riffing and they just started doing their lines and it was like, holy shit, this is good. And they looked really good. And, and it was like, the sets looked so good. And then having Michael come in because Michael had actually had to wait like a week before he started his first scene. And he was just like, he was like a Lamborghini in the garage. Like he was just waiting to get started. And I remember he did one of his monologues and we were like, this is going to work like this. All the parts are here. It's going to take some calibrating, but like, it's all here. And it was just the best feeling. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Thank hoping you for having me. That you get uh, some recognition in a couple of weeks from the Emmy nominations. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're not eligible this year, so we'll be next year. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I just hope a lot of people watch us. <laughs> June yeah, yeah. 16th. Well, I, I'm <laughs> sure you're already plotting season three, right? Oh, I mean, the dream from your mouth to creator's ears. Yeah, I want to do as many of these as we possibly can. Well, uh, from from your lips to God's ears. There you go. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. This is like, I mean, legit, my mom's favorite magazine. So this was, I was, I told her this morning, I was like, I'm going to be on Cowboys in India. She's like, what? She was like so excited. So you are well loved in our family. And thank you so much for having me today. Well, thank you very much. Back uh, before your, your parents were dating, I think, uh, I was a welfare worker. And I was also a, a freelance film critic. And there would be days uh, when I would uh, go out for lunch and interview somebody who made a million dollars for their last movie. And then come back uh, to the office and certify two or three women uh, for food stamps. And the disparity, you know, really, really hit me. And I was wondering if you had similar experiences while you were teaching during the day and during stand-up at night? Um, well, I don't know if I saw a disparity between those two uh, sort of occupations, but definitely between the occupation I have now uh, on a TV show and being an educator, a public educator. Um, you know, a, a stand-ups don't really make any money doing stand-up <laughs> unless you can get a special. Um, um, and I wasn't doing a lot of stand-up in the beginning. My comedy career was more sketch comedy. I was uh, I was doing a lot more um, sort of comedic solo performance, sketch performance, improv comedy, um, and then sort of it, it veered into solo performance and stand-up. Um, but yeah, I think I did see disparity in other ways. Um, one of the biggest um, disparities that I noticed in my comedy work and in my teaching work was how limited um, people of color have to, um, how limited the access is that people of color have to the arts. And um, that's largely because of uh, income and sort of this uh, racial wealth gap that we see in our nation. Um, I had to pay money to study comedy. I had to be able to afford classes in improv. I had to be able to, you know, pay my coaches when I had, or, or my directors when I had um, a sketch show or a comedy show. You know, these are things that require, um, you know, having a, a, um, a padded, income <laughs> and so and in fact I was I originally moved to New York City out of college to pursue performing but because I couldn't really afford to live in New York City without a, a well-paying job you know I, I tried for a, about a year to work um, in food service and I just couldn't afford to live mm -hmm. there and so I decided to um, follow the path of my parents and um, 
uh, I applied for an alternate certification teaching program called the New York Teaching Fellowship. And that's how I got into being an educator for the next decade of my life. Um, and I used the money that I made as an educator to pay for my comedy career. Well, I'll flash forward a little bit. Now you're, you're in the writer's room, this new series. And they tell you one day, we want you to play a central role in the show. First of all, is that how it happened? And did it happen in such a way like you were called into the principal's office and you were afraid that, uh oh, I screwed up. <laughs> I'm getting canned right here. I'm going back to the tables. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I, I, I had a bad day in the writer's room and they brought me in to have a discussion and they said, you know what? We like your style. <laughs> Why do you audition to be a lead? No, it didn't happen like that at all. I had no idea that I was being considered. I had no, I, I really didn't expect it. I went into the job of, a, it was my first staff writing job in television. And so I really took that seriously and I went in, you know, fully committed to, uh, just being a writer on the show and to sort of, you know, escalate through the ranks of writers to eventually someday become a producer. And, um, and I was very surprised the day that I got, um, essentially my mindset is on Mike Shore shows, he likes to sometimes cast his writers. There's a, a lot of our writers got, you know, small parts here and there on the show. And, um, one of our head writers, Eric Legend, plays the pit boss in the casino. <laughs> so I was like, ooh, I was, I was hoping that maybe they would let me audition for the role of Sally. Uh, Wayne and Sally are sort of the two res bullies. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, this, that, that's a role for me. I can do that. A, 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 you know, a small character role and, um, you know, very fun you know, very comedic. And I was really excited about that opportunity. So, so uh, Sierra put us up for a couple auditions for a couple roles. And, and the night that I expected to get an email with my sides um, for the audition for Sally, she also included sides for Regan. So I got them in my email and I thought, this is either a mistake, a huge mistake. <laughs> she accidentally sent me sides for Regan or she's considering me for this role. And, um, and the next step in this process was to go and, and do a, 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 basically a taped reading with Allison Jones, who's a really big casting director in Los Angeles. And so I, I took all of the things that I had been working on my entire adult life in comedy and I employed them and just stepped up to the challenge. <laughs> but it was very surprising. Now, earlier on, uh, I guess in the writer's room, there was a decision. We're going to have to make up a tribe. You know, mm -hmm. We have to do a fictional tribe. And I couldn't help thinking, you know, I bet you there are a lot of people out there who a, don't know they're still Native Americans uh, are, are in this country, but B, that they're in New York. Uh, yeah. What, 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 was, what, what kind of thought went into, in more or less, inventing a tribe? Well, that was a decision made by the co-creators, Sierra and um, Ed Helms and Mike Schur. And um, the decision was essentially because all of the writers, we come from different tribal nations. So mm -hmm. we are a very diverse room. Um, and uh, we have, you know, Northeastern natives in our room and in our cast. Um, and the, uh, the region that we decided to uh, position the town of Rutherford Falls in, we chose because of sort of the early, uh, colonial set settlements on the East Coast. But yes, you're right in saying that, uh, you know, I think there is like a heavy erasure of East Coast natives, um, Northeastern natives and South Southeastern natives, you know, there's a, a lot of um, history and um, presence of native people in those regions that we don't know a lot about. And so um, the Minashanka 
nation was created um, because of the amalgamation of different nations in the writer's room and because the Rutherford history isn't real. It is a <laughs> fictional history on the on the non-native side. So mm -hmm. we they wanted to create um, also a fictional history on the native side. It's only fair. And Sierra tells a story, I'm sure you can reference uh, if you sort of look back in her interviews, um, when she worked at uh, NMAI, the National Museum of the American Indian, Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. She worked there for many years before she was a TV writer. And she describes a, a scenario when the Twilight movies came out that a lot of people were you know, taking buses to NMAI to come and learn more about the Quileute tribe. And they also were taking tours in uh, Washington state, you know? And so she said that the that the woman who wrote the Twilight books, you know, put put just put through the Quileute tribe in because that's where she wanted to, you know, the region that she wanted to host her story, Twilight. And it, Sierra says it beautifully with a flick of a pen, she changed the experience of this tribal nation forever. You know, their contact with outsiders and the tourism. And um, so we didn't want to do that. <laughs> Years ago, I was on uh, the junket for, of all things, Schindler's List. And I was wow. talking with uh, Ray Fines and uh, co-star Mbeth David. And, you know, I, I asked uh, Fines, did you ever find that the other actors were intimidated by you or, or scared by you? I mean, because of, you know, that role. And he was like, oh no, we all were actors and we all knew it was make-believe. In the middle of him saying this, Embeth sort of pulled him on the sleeve and went, oh no, Rafe, we were scared of you. <laughs> we were scared of you every day. <laughs> You're terrifying. <laughs> and, and, and this actually came as a shock. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, you were this Nazi commandant, you know, killing people, maybe, you know. Now, you know, Michael Gray certainly doesn't do anything like that as, no. as Terry Thomas, but uh, is he ever intimidating? No. On the set, even early on? Well, I was intimidated by who I thought he was when I first met him, mm -hmm. but he is such a loving, compassionate, he's a father. He's so proud. Oh my gosh. During the, the, uh, production of season one there was a moment he, he he's so proud of his daughters both of his daughters are very accomplished um scholars and um performing artists I, one of his daughters is i believe enrolled in the um like the canadian ballet uh, like royal ballet I, I don't know i don't know but it's huge it's, she's about she's a ballerina and um you know, Michael Grez is a professional, oh, yes. dancer. his background is in dance. And so, and as his wife. Um, and so, yes, I, I was intimidated by who I thought that he was. I believed that he was this powerful, just like very, you know, authoritative, powerful, uh, uh, stoic uh, native man. And so, you know, first meeting him, I was like, okay, I, I gotta be ready to like, you know, you know, uh, treat him like a, an elder. And I know how to, I know how to behave around these kinds of, you know, adults <laughs> in our community and, and the, the reverence that you give to elders and make sure that he, you know, he, he knows that I'm sort of new and whatever. <laughs> anyway, he's just a goofball. Oh my God. He has just not a harsh bone in his body. The man is a complete, absolute goof. Mm -hmm. His, he, he takes forever to tell a joke. He's such a, he has dad jokes for days. He is um, so corny and loving and, and just an absolute joy to work with. It speaks to the power of his um, acting skill that he plays such an he can play such an intense person on screen and we and we use that in the show <clears throat> we love to 
put him in these powerful positions where he's able to, you know, say the truth of how he is the, he is the voice of our frustration and anger, you mm -hmm. know, as the native mm -hmm. writers. And so we use his power um, when we need it on the show. Um, now, I, I know you, you're still one of the writers, you know, uh, but uh, so far, what's been the biggest surprise for you when you've gotten your script? It's like, oh, they're, they're gonna let me do this with the character? Mm. I'm gonna get away with that? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was something you wrote, you thought they never had to let me do this. And they said, oh, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> Well, the way that, that it works on our show, and I think most TV shows is you, as a writer, you get assigned an episode mm -hmm. and, um, and you all sort of contribute to the brainstorming and the, and the breaking of that mm -hmm. episode, you know, and, and there are some jokes, you know, pitched here and there that stay throughout the end, but it goes through so many different drafts that, you know, the the chances of your joke that started in the beginning to making it to the final uh, draft is very unlikely. But I I co-wrote episode five, which is um, uh, about Terry and Regan and Nathan and Bobby. The the pairs go to mm -hmm. New York City, and um, Terry and Regan go and consult on a TV show called Adirondack. And um, it's sort of a modern Western um, as we have them. And um, they're, it, it's about, you know, they're, Nathan and Bobby are camp, are trying to get, um, trying to shake down Rutherford Inc. for some um, uh, campaign donation for Bobby's mayoral campaign. And Regan and Terry are struggling to try to uh, get the executive producers of Adirondack, the fictional show within a show we wrote um, to cut a, a, a very problematic scene from their show. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was a little bit intimidated writing that episode because I've had those experiences and, you know, it's, it's sort of saying a lot, but in a funny way. And it's what it is depicting is an experience as a young um, native person or not even a young native person, but a, a young, mm -hmm. a, a, per, a native person in this industry in a white dominated industry being called upon to consult on um, something that may or may not be out of our depth, um, and, and, and sort of the, um, the way in which we've been asked to speak on behalf of entire nations at times for productions and, and how many problems it, it causes, um, both narratively and interpersonally, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it was really fun to write that episode, but it is intimidating because it's sort of my, it, in, in two ways, it is both my, um, my love letter to native Hollywood, you know, sort of the native WGA. It's my love letter to us that we have had to like be consultants before we get hired as writers and mm -hmm. the, the weird things that we've been asked you know about ourselves and um and also it's a little bit poking fun at um some of these bigger shows and uh, you mm -hmm. know modern westerns that um don't have native writers mm -hmm. uh on their teams <laughs> um, and can sometimes be a little bit exploitative mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, were you the writer who came up with the idea uh, for your, your character having a thing going on with a hunky NPR guy? I mean, uh... Uh, no. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, come on. No. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> no. As my, father used to say, as my father used to say, you go to hell for lying just as soon as you will for stealing. <laughs> I was very intimidated having to do romance scenes with Dustin. Um, but no, you know who that is? That's Sierra Teller Ornelas, our showrunner. She loves rom-coms. And, and all of the Native writers, you know, and non-Native writers got to have a piece of themselves in our two seasons. You know, we've all got like 
for you know she loves rom-com so she keeps you know she wants Regan to have these love affairs with people she and Regan mm -hmm. has a new um romantic interest in season two um so uh she was responsible for the initial love affair and the second love affair and you know our our Mohawk writer uh Diet Sarondere uh Leclerc he loves Halloween and he loves uh holiday episodes of any show so he pitched a, a Halloween episode this season and um so we all sort of have our little I picked the I pitched the consulting uh episode you know that was something mm -hmm. I wanted to show so we're really getting an opportunity to sort of uh do our fun like throw our our noodle at the wall each of us and and have our our special moment and for Sierra, she just wants to see, she wants to see native love. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Tune in tonight for a hot native love on <laughs> Rutherford Falls. <laughs> Rutherford Falls after dark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. And I'm, I'm glad uh, to see you are seem to be doing better because on Twitter you uh, indicated you were not doing well recently. Oh yes, I I had I had a false positive COVID test. Oh yes, I had a false home test because well, that's, that's what's happening now. But now we have to take home tests. We've moved away from doing in person testing on in the studio and. And now we're doing home tests. So the chances of them being false is very high. Yes, yes. Well, be safe, uh, stay well, and I'm looking forward to season three. Thank you kindly, Joe. Take care now. Bye Thank now. You.